Assalamu alaikum ladies and gentlemen and welcome to today's panel where we have a stellar lineup to discuss rethinking Pakistan's climate policy. It's perhaps fitting that this session is taking place in Lahore, a city where you don't need to look very far to find the effects of climate change, you just have to take a very deep breath and you will feel it in your chest. Uh, perhaps we can hear that from the audience by a show of hands. Have you felt the effect of climate change over the past few years? Uh, raise your hands if yes. It seems to be pretty much everybody. We have a consensus on that. So without further ado, we'll move towards uh, our panelists to hear what we can do about it. First of all, uh, Mr. Barrister Amir Zafar Khan is a lawyer licensed to practice in the high courts of Pakistan and the New York State Supreme Court. He's also an assistant professor at the University of Lahore and Foreman Christian College, University of Lahore, where he teaches environmental law. Barrister Anisa Aga is an experienced litigator and advocate of the high courts. She has served as co-chairperson of the Lahore High Court Bar Association Environment Protection and Climate Change Committee. Mr. Ahmed Rafe Alam is one of Pakistan's leading environmental lawyers, vice president of the Pakistan Environmental Law Association and a Yale World Fellow. Barrister Amir, we'd like to begin with you. As someone who deals with environmental law in an academic setting, but also practices it before the courts, do you find a disparity between theoretical conceptions of environmental law and practical ones? Has the enactment of laws been sufficient to improve the situation in Pakistan? And if not, where do you think we can find a way forward? Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity today. And I believe that uh, environment and climate change is the most important and, and indeed an existential issue for uh, people of Pakistan right now. So uh, to come to your question, whether there is a disparity between uh, the laws and practicality, yes. Whereas we do have laws, um, I think our basic law is the Environmental Protection Act. Uh, the problem with that, what I've seen is that the laws haven't really been updated over time. Even if you take, like you mentioned, Lahore's uh, smog issue these days, if you take a look at the air pollution issue which is affecting us every day, um, uh, when you look at the laws, there are certain standards which are set in it and uh, the, the air pollution is measured against it. But the problem is that there are no concentrated or directed laws towards mitigating effects from air pollution. So, for example, uh, the laws are silent on what to do with the underlying causes of air pollution. Um, I believe one of the major causes of air pollution, especially in this area over here, is the quality of petroleum products with, that is being used in the transportation sector or the power sector. Uh, whereas the world has moved on to, so uh, worldwide there is a Euro standard of petroleum that is used. So whereas the world has moved on to Euro 6, we in Pakistan are still at Euro 2. And if you uh, go into details about Euro 2, the fuel that is sold in Pakistan is not even Euro 2. It's worse quality than Euro 2 and it is artificially inflated. So the problem is that obviously when you use bad fuel products in your transportation sector and when it combusts and it goes up into the air, you naturally get affected. Now if, it, if you were to challenge this law or uh, uh, if you were to challenge uh, this you know, problem, where would you go? The Environmental Protection Act is not really equipped to deal with, uh, you know, the uh, environmental or air pollution issues that are affecting us today in 2022. The laws that we have are pretty much stagnant since the law came into being in 1997, which is uh, now uh, in Punjab, if you look at it, it's the EPA 2012. So one of the issues that I see is that post the 18th Amendment uh, to the Constitution, there is a the huge disparity comes into being because the federal and the provincial governments aren't able to work together to come up with a uniform policy. Even though they, they do have a Climate Action Council, uh, Rafi Sab, I believe you are a part of it. So they haven't been able to come up with a uniform policy which can be implemented across Pakistan because what if the federal government comes up with a policy? How would you implement that in Punjab, for example? Or if Punjab comes up with a policy, how would you implement that in Sindh? So there are these issues, uh, policy issues that we are dealing with and which is becoming a big hindrance in uh, mitigating environmental issues. Uh, 
So yes, there is a big disparity to answer your question. Uh, thank you. Moving on to Barrister Anisa. Uh, Madam, as someone with extensive legal experience in Pakistan who also has had the opportunity to serve in a bar committee, how do you view the Lahore High Court's decision to close private schools on certain days as a result of smog? Are the courts playing an effective role in combating climate change? And how do you think they can find the right balance between complacency and judicial overreach? Uh, thank you, Hassan. Thank you for inviting me and uh, for the question. Um, yes, in my view, uh, the decision of the Lahore High Court to close down schools in order to combat smog is uh, definitely judicial overreach. But at the same time, uh, it is because of a certain set of circumstances, which is that there's absolutely no government action, uh, whether provincial or federal, in terms of combating uh, air pollution or climate change. So um, in those circumstances, courts are the only avenue we have in terms of uh, any uh, arm of the state stepping in to balance those uh, interests of different stakeholders. Um, and this is true the world over. Uh, governments all over the world uh, show reluctance in implementing um, environmentally friendly laws. Um, even in advanced democracy, we see the same reluctance when it comes to uh, introducing mitigation measures um, to stop global warming. And, uh, and I think because of that, there is a growing acceptance of uh, judicial overreach and there seems to be like a climate exception when it comes to uh, judicial overreach where courts have taken on this mantle of being climate crusaders and enforcers of uh, the human right to a clean and healthy environment. Um, we see this in other countries as well. Um, so if you look at, um, it's one of the first leading cases was in the Netherlands a court uh, in the Urgenda case, um, the court, uh, the Supreme Court in the Netherlands held that the government's um, uh, target emissions of a cut of 17% in their projected emissions was not ambitious enough under the Paris Agreement framework. And uh, they said, no, it should be 25%. Now that's clearly judicial uh, policy making and law making, but uh, uh, even in systems which are closer to, uh, legal systems that are closer to ours, like the UK, for instance, at the Court of Appeal level, um, the court held that the Heathrow third runway project was scrapped because it failed to take into account um, the Britain, uh, the mitigation targets of Britain. The judgment was reversed at the UK Supreme Court, but even at that level, there was engagement. Um, last month in Australia, a coal mine project was scrapped based on uh, climate uh, mitigation uh, measures. So uh, judicial overreach in climate change litigation is uh, not particular to Pakistan at all. Um, however, going back to your original question, uh, the first question, uh, how do I view the um, closure of uh, schools? Uh, I think it's completely unfair on uh, mothers of young kids um, and caregivers in general. Um, I think in a way the state has passed on the burden um, on to parents and caregivers, which um, like my legal issue with the decision is one of the fundamental principles of environmental law is uh, the polluter pays principle. Where in this judgment is the polluter playing out of the list of polluters. Um, so why was action not directed 
uh, towards um, indis uh, it is, uh, I think the full extent of the judgment also has uh, 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 penalties for other uh, polluting industries, but uh, I do think that even if the um, emissions from transport from school going kids was the aim, uh, I believe there could have been other methods uh, where schools could be mandated to provide buses uh, for the transport of uh, students. Uh, but then, at the same time, this is the classic problem with uh, relying on courts with judicial overreach that uh, be careful what you wish for. So you can't uh, fully uh, plan for what particular form uh, of uh, relief you will get at the end of the day. Right. Thank you very much for these insightful uh, analyses on the way that the courts perhaps might be uh, might be falling short, uh, for, for lack of a better word. With that, that ties into my next question to Mr. Ahmed Rafi Alam about the other stakeholders in this issue and the other people who perhaps might be in a position to improve things. Uh, Mr. Alam, you've played an active role in litigation relating to environmental law during cases particularly of note, such as that of the Ravi Urban Development Authority. Mm -hmm. To what extent do you believe that corporations and political entities in Pakistan are complicit in the climate crisis? And to this extent, does Pakistan's legal system serve as a barrier or a weapon? Uh, thank you, Hassan. Uh, but first, I'd like to thank the Youth Assembly for inviting me here and allowing me to participate and to share a stage. I was quite honored with Pakistan's first female judge of the Supreme Court. Thank you for that opportunity. Let me set the stage before I answer this question. I, I want to, you know, often when I talk about climate change and you compare it to other things, uh, I, I feel that people don't know uh, how bad climate change or the climate crisis is. The climate crisis or the climate change is just that. The climate is changing. You are getting unprecedented and unexpected changes in long-standing weather patterns. And this is important because the earth and the ecosystem that supports us, our lives, the fact that there's air to breathe and water, is in a balance. And that balance, to some extent, is shaped by weather. How we, you know, our seasons are shaped by weather, whether we, uh, even our celebrations, our cultural celebrations are shaped by when it rains, when it's cold, when it's hot. So this balance is being upended, upended by climate change. Now climate change is caused by greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases trap the sun's heat in the atmosphere and raise temperatures. So right now, because of greenhouse gases in 2022 uh, and the use of greenhouse gases since the Industrial Revolution, the Earth is, you'd be surprised, no more than one degree centigrade on average warmer than it was before the Industrial Revolution. Just one degree on account of these greenhouse gases. And greenhouse gases are produced, frankly, any time you take something out of the ground to burn it for your energy or your transport needs. Chaibo, Coal ho, drakht ho, gas ho, patrol ho. Jab aap usko zameen se nikal ke jalate hain, you produce greenhouse gases. Oh yeah, that and agriculture. Agriculture also is a huge contributor uh, by way of methane of greenhouse gases. So we are now at one degrees warmer than the pre-industrial levels and we've seen just this year unbelievable heat waves, not just in Pakistan but throughout the world. There was a drought in China that's perhaps the worst they've experienced in thousands of years. And there was a drought in Canada, a heat wave in Canada. Uh, there were floodings in the Philippines. There was flooding in Nigeria. There was flooding in Spain. Uh, there were hurricanes in America. And of course, the floods in Pakistan of biblical proportions. And we know these floods in Pakistan, these were monsoon floods. These were not the rivers breaking their banks. This was excess rain, between four to 800% more rain in Balochistan and Sindh than uh, average monthly levels. And there's a, a, something called an attribution science, which uh, conducted by the University, no, Imperial College London earlier this year, that said that up to 70% of the intensity of the rainfall that fell over Pakistan today, uh, this, this year, was because of this one degree temperature increase caused by climate change. So it is very much a man-made disaster. 
uh, that, that, that Pakistan has experienced. And, you know, this, is the, this has been the coolest summer for the rest of our lives. It's getting warmer very fast because unless unprecedented steps are taken to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we will continue to see global temperatures rise to about 1.5 degrees by the end of this decade and perhaps as high as 2 degrees uh, by the middle of this century. Now, I cannot begin to describe to you the devastating impact this has on nature, on livelihoods, on agriculture, food production, and human lives. It, it, it is nothing short of that. And air pollution plays a large part of this. Uh, air pollution is caused by, I mean, you're burning fossil fuels. Why is it the air pollution? And the WHO says that there are approximately 7 million people who die every year on account of air pollution. 7 million people. So if, if we go, I mean, and that's 7 million people, if you project it in the next 15, 20 years, it's, it's, you know, it's a substantial, it's, it's millions and millions of people are going to die because of air pollution in the coming years. And this death, just as an example of climate change, there are other impacts of climate change. There's flooding related deaths and destruction as well, but just air pollution is 7 million people a year. These deaths are not going to be equally distributed amongst the earth or the countries of the earth. There are going to be concentrations of, of air pollution that are going to cause disproportionate carnage in the world. And those areas are cities in Asia and Africa on account of transport. That's us, Calcutta to Kabul. That's us, our families, our parents, our siblings, our children are going to be the ones facing the brunt of this climate crisis. And it's going to get worse. So to come now to address this, that's by way of backdrop, are corporations doing enough? Well, frankly, no, because while we know that greenhouse gases cause climate change, we have to understand what drives climate change. Because we are using coal for thousands of years. Why is it bad now? Well, it's because it's driven by things like capitalism, consumerism, the patriarchy, and the colonialism. These are systems that drive climate change. And as Madam Aisha Malik pointed out, uh, the patriarchy is so strong, it drives such a strong narrative in our lives, in our society, that it often makes us forget or not ask the very basic questions that are in front of us. There are about 70 or 80 companies that have produced two-thirds of all greenhouse gases historically. Just about 90, 70, 90 companies. A system like capitalism is so powerful that we socially accept billionaires when in fact their corporations are earning billions of dollars, spreading fossil fuels and endangering the future of civilization. I mean, that's how powerful the, the, the narrative of capitalism is. And the same is true with the patriarchy. Why aren't women in decision-making seats everywhere? You know, I recently had the opportunity to go to the conference of parties at Sharm El Sheikh and I can report to you that the only people who moved and shook that conference and got things done were women. From the first, uh, first minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, to our own minister of climate change, Sherry Rahman, these were the people driving the show. Mard kuch nahi karte and that the narrative is so poorly framed that we don't we think it's common, it's bilkul theek hai, aurton ko hona hi nahi chahiye. And the same is true with consumerism. Consumerism drives uh, the, 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 the climate crisis because it's perfectly acceptable for us to want to have coffee in the morning and have it flown 6,000 miles from South America, leaving a huge carbon footprint so that we can wake up early in the morning. But if you want to wake up early in the morning, go to sleep at night. Consumerism drives the climate crisis and it's these things that make, well, you ask about corporations, corporations are doing bugger all about climate change in Pakistan. I mean, zyada se zyada Nestle wo plastic se paper ke straw pe aajayega. Ya Unilever people will try and make you believe that the plastic that they use is 33% more recyclable than other plastic. I mean, ye choti moti baatein hoti hain. They're not addressing the real elephant in the room, which is all of our futures. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we heard from all three of our panelists and we're going to open up the discussion a bit with a bit more flexibility. First, to recap on uh, a little bit briefly on what we've heard so far, we heard from Barrister Amir about uh, petro the impact of petroleum products laws in contributing to climate change. We've heard from Barrister Anisa about how courts have played a role as climate crusaders but haven't quite found the right balance 
between complacency and judicial overreach. And we heard from Mr. Ahmed Rafi Alam about how the intersection between capitalism and patriarchy plays a role in the entirety of this crisis. Now, the audience here is comprised mainly of young people. And for our panelists, I think that's important to note in that these are the people who are going to be impacted the most. To tie that in with Mr. Ahmed Rafi Alam's point, it's going to be disproportionately developing countries, it's going to be minorities, it's going to be women who are impacted by these things. So my question as we open up this panel a little bit, and as you can, please feel free to interject at any point, please feel free to jump in as you deem fit, is how should the young people in this audience channel their outrage and their anger against the system and frustration as to how it isn't helping them, isn't addressing their issues when it comes to the courts, when it comes to the laws, and when it comes to the entirety of society. So any of the three panelists, if you'd like to jump in on this uh, question, please feel free to take the conversation in the direction that you fit, but you feel fit, but beginning with that question of what should the youth do right now? If the laws aren't helping them, the courts aren't helping them, and the capitalist system isn't helping them either. This she Absolutely. Um, well, uh, you could all think of, of, of proposing, you see, Pakistan has a climate change council which is uh, responsible for forming climate policy in Pakistan. And I found, there was a recent meeting of the climate council, I'm a member of the council, and I found just, you know, looking around the room that I was the second youngest person on the council. And there's a fellow called Salman Zaidi from Islamabad, who's the youngest, and uh, that's unacceptable. Uh, at Sharm el-Sheikh, youth delegations from Pakistan made a point to ask the ministry to have youth representation on the Climate Council. And while the secretary is, is mindful to do so, he had requested uh, youth forums like yourselves uh, to collect uh, together and make a joint proposal to become a member of the Climate Council. So I think that's one thing you should certainly put on your agenda. I can connect you with other youth activists throughout Pakistan so that you can make a formal application and have yourself on the decision-making table. If not one, then at least two seats. Um, well, that's what you can do if you want to be nice. <laughs> uh, please note that in the 20th century, the most successful forms of activism were the civil disobedience pioneered by uh, actually Indian freedom fighters. I mean, the Indians got, well, we were Indian at the time, got the British, the biggest colonial force on earth, out of India using direct action. Um, and that was also copied and followed by the uh, uh, African-American movement in the United States in the 50s and 60s. Again, civil resistance, civil disobedience. And it was also followed by Extinction Rebellion globally. Because if you want to get something done and heard quickly, I mean, you can join the Climate Council. Uh, climate Council ki agli meetings agli shayad char saal mein hogi, and you can get your voice heard. But the climate crisis is so advanced um, that many people are, t are talking about direct action, about you know, uh, getting arrested to prove the point. And you're beginning to see educated people, people with PhDs, scientists, getting arrested just to draw attention to the fact that the climate crisis is real and politicians are not listening. They're not listening. Uh, just one other thought, the, uh, the difference between one and a half and two degrees of warming on Earth is going to be about 150 million lives. And remember, uh, we get from 1.5 to two degrees by the middle of this century in your lifetimes. 150 million people is four times the number of soldiers who died in World War I and World War II put together. And you're going to experience that disproportionately in places like Pakistan. You are. Um, that's, that's, that's a very grim future. And politicians keep on putting off this 1.5 pledge. You know, you want to keep global temperatures to 1.5, and it's increasingly difficult to do so. And I'm beginning to think that the difference between 1.5 and 2 is not things like numbers. It's the most amount of death and carnage world leaders are willing to absorb in their own political constituencies. In other words, they will survive and they'll let us die. So if this is a world you want to live in, you've got to find more effective ways of getting your voices heard. You can join the councils, you can raise a voice, or you think about something a little bit more radical. Uh, just to connect that with the point that Barrister uh, Amir had mentioned earlier, you'd mentioned the, uh, earlier as well, you'd mentioned the disastrous quality of Pakistan's petroleum and how this seems to be of a lower quality than anywhere else on the planet and how that is contributing to a disproportionate extent to Pakistan's climate change and climate crisis. 
So just to connect that to what Mr. Ahmed Rafi Alam was mentioning earlier, do you think that Pakistan's youth needs to be out on the streets, needs to be protesting, needs to be getting their voice heard on this issue in particular, on the quality of petroleum in Pakistan? As an environmental law professor, I'm sure you'd be in the best position to guide us on that. Absolutely. I definitely believe that students, especially the younger lot, should go out and protest. Uh, <clears throat> not just protest, become pressure groups get a hold of the stakeholders, you know, the members of parliament. I don't know if you know or not, the interesting thing is that when you look at politicians in Pakistan, not any particular party in general, uh, you will never hear what their core function is. Their core function is not to go and get your, you know, roads fixed or your, you know, telephone lines fixed. Their core function is legislating. You know, their core function is to come up with laws and policies which affect your daily lives. So I would definitely encourage you people to go out, especially these days when you go out, you can hardly breathe. And interestingly, uh, you would be shocked to uh, hear that studies have shown that bad air quality actually affects your IQ as well. So over the next 10, 15 years, you will see a significant dumbing down of our population. So do you think as a, fu as a society, we'll be functioned with say, you know, a collective, not collective, an average IQ of say 110, 100, I doubt it. So I think it is your generation which is most at stake. And like I mentioned earlier as well, we are in an existential crisis in Pakistan. So I would definitely encourage you guys to go out and protest. You know, a lot of people protest, say, in front of the Punjab Assembly, you know, for their rights and everything. You don't have to go and, you know, do a dharna or something. But to begin with, at least get a hold of your area's representatives, you know, whoever is representing you in your, you know, your local MPA or your local MNA. Get a hold of the people uh, around you and go and ask them these pointed questions that what exactly are you doing for our health? See, the quality of fuel is a low-hanging fruit. It's not too difficult. All they have to do is stop the import of bad quality fuel and switch to Euro 5, for example. That's it. Uh, in addition to that, all they have to do is to legislate and bring in laws, uh, firmer laws, uh, in order to check your vehicles, you know, get your vehicle testing uh, laws regulated. So these two things, I would say, are really low-hanging fruit, which shouldn't be really an issue. But if for the stakeholders to do that, I think you guys definitely need to uh, get out and protest about it. Right. These are alarming uh, statistics and facts indeed and it ac actually reminds me of a point that Barrister Anissa was mentioning earlier of the courts emerging as sort of climate crusaders which is of course a thing to be critiqued when it goes into the realm of judicial overreach. But in their defense, one also thinks, okay, where else are we finding a climate crusader? Are we finding one in parliament? Are we finding one in senate? Uh, do we need more climate crusaders or do we need less? So how do you think that uh, that approach by the court is contrasted with perhaps complacency on other ends. I know that all th the entirety of the panel today happen to be lawyers as well, but as climate change activists too, where do you think that the arms of the government are falling behind when contrasted to that of the courts? Um, I think they're far behind. Um, yeah, so I think uh, the other arms of government are far behind compared to courts and um, and it's true, it's because of that frustration that uh, as climate activists, you feel that your voices are not getting heard by uh, the executive or the lawmakers that we end up in courts. So um, it is mostly lawyers at the Lahore High Court who file public interest litigation trying to uh, bring these issues um, up. And I do think it is effective for what it is in terms of starting a conversation, in terms of um, bringing together all the relevant uh, stakeholders, because like Amir said, you know, a common citizen is not going to know uh, that the air pollution is because of low quality petroleum. So we have to use whatever uh, sector knowledge or expertise that you have and channel, um, like you said, channel your outrage, don't just keep it in. So if uh, protesting is not your cup of tea, you can still channel it out on uh, social media.
that is uh, still effective. Uh, politicians do care about how uh, they uh, are perceived on social media. Uh, ministries do care about, you know, if you have influence on social media, please do use it. And um, in terms of what students can do, I also think research is uh, very readily available now online. Um, and our governments are definitely not collecting data. It is activists and climate crusaders who are gathering information and putting it online available for everybody to tap into. So uh, just as an example, recently um, uh, there was an organization, uh, it's called climatetrace.org. Uh, you can go online and check different greenhouse gas emissions in your area, uh, including Pakistan. So it's the world over, you can check what level of um, you know, uh, carbon dioxide or methane is being emitted from uh, different sources like a power plant or an airport. So that level of detail is readily available. And um, yeah, my message would be that please research and talk about it, create awareness. Right, Mr. Rafi Alam touched on a bit of this point earlier, so I'd love to hear a bit deeper, go a bit deeper into your thoughts on this, since uh, Madam uh, Anissa Haga has mentioned a bit about that dichotomy between being a climate crusader, going into the courts, and being on social media. So that leads me to the question to you, sir, about um, we've established already how much of a perennial defining issue this is for our times, how it's an existential threat for our youth in particular. When, if, and if the climate uh, crisis is to be addressed, do you believe that that battle will be won in the courts or on the streets? And uh, if you have uh, issues with that question, I'd love to hear that as well. But how do you look at um, examples abroad where the, the extremities are chosen to get that level of attention? For example, a Just Stop Oil protests, blocking highways, uh, throwing cans of tomato soup at paintings. Do you think that's the solution? <laughs> yes, I believe in the cans of tomatoes uh, at art. Because Wonderful. what is art when there's no civilization? at the end of the day. Uh, look, uh, the, this will have to be on the streets. Courts of law are places where legal questions are resolved and primarily uh, the law is to preserve the sacrosanct concept of individual property rights. It's not to fix the climate crisis. The climate crisis is driven by capitalism, consum consumerism, the patriarchy, colonialism and the fossil fuel economy. The distortions of capitalism are before us. Uh, the inequities of patriarchy are before us. Capitalism and patriarchy go hand in hand. Colonialism has been nothing but the exploitation of, of, of natural resources and human labor for profit. Um, and it's all driven by the fossil fuel economy. These things won't change by courts. These things will change by society and politics. Again, these, these are issues, air pollution and climate change are two environmental issues that you can't do much about individually. If you want to reduce the amount of plastic you produce, you can do something about it. If you want to reduce the amount of water you consume, you can do something about it. But if you want to fix air quality, you have to change the fuels that are imported into Pakistan. You can't do anything about that individually. If you want to address climate change, you have to address our transport sector, our energy sector, and the way our cities are designed. That can't be done individually. That has to be done by social and political movements. So these are two environmental issues where it's absolutely important for people to work together. And for that, you need awareness and you need empathy. Most crucially, in a time of climate crisis, when, when well-established sort of institutions are being shaken, I can't stress enough how important it is always to remember and recognize the humanity in other individuals. That is empathy, and you're going to need that in the time of the climate crisis when you're out on the streets making the world a better place. Best Ramir, I'd love to get your response to that uh, as uh, somebody who teaches environmental law, as somebody who practices environmental law before the courts, on the statement, uh, on, uh, on Mr. Ahmed Rafi Alam's uh, uh, very clear statement that if the battle is to be won, it is to be won on the streets rather than the courts. Do you, do you feel, a, do you agree or do you feel a different way on that? 
approach. I actually agree with that reason being that there are a couple of petitions that I've filed which have been languishing in the courts uh, for the past several years. And uh, normally, I would have expected that, you know, if I have filed something, you know, in relation to the environment, at least it will be heard. But uh, the problem is that because there's hardly any pressure on the streets, even our judiciary isn't too serious about tackling this issue. Forget about the, you know, the uh, legislature side of things. So yes, I do believe that the battle ha will be fought on the streets the way that we are going. Uh, there is simply no other choice um, because uh, uh, on the face of it, the other organs of the state have really failed to provide us with the, you know, uh, if you look at uh, the uh, air pollution issue, it has been going on for how many years now? I think over 10, yeah, roughly 10. Yeah, uh, I remember, you know, uh, since I moved back four years ago, it was the first time that I started getting a headache. And then I spoke to Rafi Saab and I was like, you know, I don't know why I get this, you know, constant headache 24 hours a day. And then we, I realized after speaking to uh, him that it was because of the smog. Right. So it does affect your health, your physiology. And uh, uh, if this issue has been going on for over 10 years and we've been having this conversation, uh, with the stakeholders, we've been going through the judiciary and every year you see that, you know, including me, we file PILs, public interest litigation when the, you know, the smog season is at its peak. And then everything just falls by the wayside once, you know, the thoda mausam kuch betar ho jata hai aur wo jab smog nazar nahi aari hoti, people start for forgetting it. So, uh, yes, so unless we take things into, you know, uh, that direction, as Rafi Saab suggested, I don't see a solution. Right. Just before we move into our question answer session, because I know our audience is excited to ask you all their own questions as well, I'd love to hear from Barrister Anissa as well, just so we know if we have a consensus from this entire panel. Do you too agree that the fight will be won in the streets rather than the courts? Um, no, I think the fight should be everywhere. My only problem with the streets narrative is I think uh, women get, the streets are not safe for women. So I, I feel automatically half of your population is not really engaged in that um, conversation. Uh, and so for that matter, I, I do think the courts provided relatively, although again, 2% of the judiciary uh, is female, but still relatively it's a, uh, it does a better job of balancing the, uh, those uh, conflicting interests. Thank uh, you. So, so I, I, I think it, it should be fought in the streets, uh, in courts, on social media, on every uh, aspect of society. Right, thank you. So I'll conclude that we have a two-thirds majority on the proposition that the battle should be entirely on the streets. But of course, we'd love to hear from our audience as well. If we can move towards audience questions, um, I believe we'll have people raise their hands if they have a question. Yes, we have someone at the back, please. So I'll be asking about, uh, you were talking about uh, smoke and you know, the, the impact of fossil fuels on the environment. My question is basically, if you don't use oil, and if you are opting for other energy resources, you have not developed that kind of capacity and capabilities in this country. Uh, so on one side, we should not be opting for coal for uh, energy purposes to, to manufacture, you know, different kind of FMC goods or other kind of goods which are vital for our economic growth. So what other options do you have? I mean, ek, uh, ke substitute to at the same time hona chahiye agar aap ek aisi policy banate hain jisme uh, energy inputs, just cheap energy inputs, and by the way, um, since I am from the industry, I know that we are even importing coal. We are not using our own coal. We are uh, even in, in our uh, cement sector, the coal, coal is being imported from uh, South Africa and different other countries. Uh, and that is quite expensive. So, if you shift this shift, then the cost of goods will increase. Usko kaun How we can handle that? Yaar, mujhe uh, samajh nahi aati. Yeah cost of goods and economic development versus 7 million deaths a year. 
which do you prefer? Your parents to die of lung cancer or a 2% increase in GDP? I mean, what's the narrative here? Where is the morality for God's sakes? How can, see, this is the power of capitalism. It makes us think, look at the incredible threat to civilization fossil fuels pose. And many times the responses I get are, what about economic, is economic development bhaar mein jai? Aisi economic development mujhe chahiye nahi. Right now in Pakistan, Nisa, correct me, renewable energies are cheaper than all other types of fossil fuel, all other types of electricity, including hydro. Yet, despite this, we continue to invest in fossil fuel long-term, IPP, fossil fuel contracts. We should respect life, our lives, other people's lives, and design a system of economics around this. Capitalism is an excuse and always has been to exploit natural resources and human labor to, to concentrate wealth in the hands of the few. And in doing so, creating poverty elsewhere. That's what capitalism does. Billionaires are policy failures, and yet we think that they're some sorts of gods. Ye, this thinking is very wrong. I don't care what economic development happens or doesn't happen. I'm more concerned about the future of civilization and our lives. Vaisht uh, Nisa, your response? Um, completely agree with Rafa's view, but even within that narrative, you have to capitalism. Ko bhi khatam karna. Those are satra say renewable energy has been cheaper. So renewable energy is solar energy and wind energy and bagas. Uh, it has been cheaper. And yet the government has done nothing to integrate more renewable energy into our grid. So um, I've also filed a public interest litigation on exactly this issue that say solar or wind is cheaper, why are we still setting up coal power plants? There, like throughout uh, like 50 years of people setting up coal power plants, we did nothing. The moment, like I think two or three years before uh, solar uh, energy prices uh, got lower than all fossil fuel based energy, we have set up like 6,000 megawatts of uh, coal power plants. Um, so uh, even if you don't want to change the whole system or whatever, it makes no sense uh, that we continue to invest in uh, fossil fuel energy. Uh, since 2017, uh, the percentage of renewables in our entire national grid, installed generation capacity, which is 5.10%, and now it's 5.10%. Despite renewable energy being cheaper for going on five years now, uh, it is still at 5.30%. So I, I, I think, like, it makes no sense, it makes no economic sense. And yet, uh, because of that, uh, I, I guess, hangover from that uh, capitalist uh, system where fossil fuels are, uh, you know, there's a very strong fossil fuel lobby the world over, not just in Pakistan, that we continue to. Uh, All right, with that, we can move forward to any other questions. Uh, we have uh, someone at the very front. Uh, please. Uh, Asalaamu As Alaikum. Thank you so much, Jee, for the wonderful discussion. I agree with some of the speakers about uh, us having to do a lot of climate activism in Pakistan to bring about positive change. But I also want to address the big issue, which is that Pakistan is not contributing as much to the uh, global carbon footprint as Western countries, as the US, as even China. But we are not addressing these issues on uh, an international level. So my basic question is, what can we in the global south, countries which are being disproportionately affected by global warming, how can we put pressure on the countries which are making, doing most of the damage? And we are paying the price. So uh, maybe Ahmed Rafi Alam Saab specifically, what would you say about this? Looking at the international level, uh, this has become a problem, you know, at the international level, developed countries are supposed to mitigate greenhouse gases and developing countries are supposed to adapt to them. 
and there's a there's a promise of what's called equity in the principles of common but differentiated responsibilities where rich countries are supposed to finance developing countries for their adaptation needs at the same time as mitigating uh, their own greenhouse gases these promises haven't been kept you know uh, in both in terms of mitigation and in terms of financing for adaptation and as a result we're beginning to see more and more climate catastrophes around the world where countries like Pakistan countries like Nigeria Mozambique uh, continually hit by climate disasters finding it very difficult to get back on their feet economically the World Bank has estimated that these floods this year uh, just the reconstruction cost not the relief effort that's going on right now but all the roads that have been sort of swept away the hospitals and schools that have been destroyed the rebuilding of them is going to cost somewhere in the nature of 30 billion dollars which is a substantial amount of Pakistan's overall economy Pakistan just doesn't have that money to do the reconstruction and so at the international level it Pakistan's case highlighted the need for what's caused called a loss and damage facility a fund of money made available to countries that are vulnerable to climate change that may access that money not as a grant not as a loan without any terms and conditions attached but as a down payment on climate justice for the broken promises of the global north and that loss and damage facility uh, largely due to Pakistan's lobbying for it before and during the COP was actually made into a reality I mean we do now have a loss and damage facility as the result of COP 27 there are plenty of questions left about how such a facility will be used. I mean, Pakistan ko abhi paise to nahi milne wale. We're not going to get $30 billion. But we have, at the international level, been at the forefront of creating a mechanism of climate justice. There are plenty of questions still outstanding on how this climate justice will work. But we are on the forefront of putting it front and center. And hopefully by next COP, COP28, we'll have some of the answers to the many questions of how such a facility will work. You know, which countries will contribute to it in what amount, in what proportion, and what countries will receive this money, and what transparent frameworks do these countries have to ensure that the money they receive goes on projects and people who deserve it in a sustainable and resilient way, and not, for example, in corruption or subsidizing the automobile industry or the real estate sector or something. So these questions have yet to be answered. But Pakistan, I might, might say, I, you know, I was part of the team. We punched way ahead of our, our sort of body weight. We, we performed spectacularly, along with coordination with the rest of the world to put this loss and damage facility on paper and hopefully uh, activate it later on as well. Uh, thank you. Can we get a question from the gentleman who uh, raised his hand earlier? Assalamualaikum, uh, sir. Sir, Pakistan already the World Climate Index is the eighth number, pe, most vulnerable country to the climate change. And our ideal is the Paris Agreement. We have to do the two Celsius degree. Ideal hai kam karna. Despite that, if we have to do the same thing, Pakistan is not going to cycle. Because we have to do the polar regions, hai, glaciers, and the glaciers. We have to do the North and South Pole. We have to do the first number. We have to do the glaciers. So, this is super flood 2010. 10 billion loss ke saath iske baad ye jo flood aaya 2020 2022 ka 14 billion humne lost kiya to isi tarah ye cycle kam hote hote hum ye duration aur bhi kam hoga to hum is crisis se kis tarah niklenge kya hum ye jo provincial bodies hai disaster management isse bhi log mutmain nahi is pe is cheez pe work nahi kar rahe aur ye climate change pakistan ki politics ko kis tarah shape kar sakta hai aane wale dino mein thank you sir would like to answer that by mr amir or anyone else मेरे ख्याल से आपका सवाल था डिजास्टर मैनेजमेंट सर जो आइडियल है ना इस वक्त पेरिस एग्रीमेंट है जी जी बिल्कुल ठीक है उसके मुताबिक 2 सेल्सियस डिग्री हमने कम करना है 2 सेल्सियस डिग्री कम करने के बावजूद पाकिस्तान इस इंडेक्स लिस्ट से नहीं निकल सकता है हमने विटनेस किया 2010 के फ्लड को उसके बाद 2022 के फ्लड को और आने वाले दिनों में ये साइकिल और भी कम होगा जल्दी हम हिट करने वाला है 10 बिलियन लॉस फिर 14 बिलियन लॉस इसके बाद हमें और भी ज्यादा नहीं एब्सोल्युटली ठीक है सो बेसिकली you are absolutely right. Uh, so we have to be prepared. Uske liye jo hai, we need to change our way of life. We need to bring in laws. We need to bring in a public awareness. We need to get all the stakeholders together. Because now the flooding, jo hai, for example, this year's flooding is anticipated to happen again. So what can we do about it? We need to bring in mitigating factors, which we anticipate certain things will happen. 
सो उस हिसाब से जो है यू यू नो यू फिक्स योर लॉज यू ब्रिंग इन पॉलिसीज आप जिस तरह डिजास्टर एन डी एम ए जो है फॉर एग्जाम्पल या पी डी एम ए जो है आप उनको उनको फंडिंग दें आप मजीद मजबूत करें फॉर एग्जाम्पल अगर कोई एरियाज जो हैं वो लो लाइंग एरियाज हैं एंड यू एक्सपेक्ट दैट द फ्लडिंग विल ऑबियसली कैरी द होल विलेज अवे ठीक है आइर यू यू नो यू टेक द ईजी वे आउट एंड यू मूव द विलेज आउट ऑफ दैट एरिया ठीक है और यू बिल्ड इन डाइक्स अराउंड इट यू मिटिगेट दोज थिंग्स वॉट यू आर सेंग इज एब्सोटली करेक्ट एंड द अदर थिंग इज बिकॉज ऑफ द दी कंज्यूमरिज्म आप कह लें या वट एवर बिकॉज जिस एरिया की आप बात कर रहे हैं वेयर देर आर अ लॉट ऑफ ग्लेशियर्स देर इज अ लॉट ऑफ हैवी व्हीकल ट्रैफिक ओवर देयर विच एमिनेट अ लॉट ऑफ डीजल डीजल बेस्ड गाड़ियाँ जो हैं वो काफ़ी एयर पोल्यूशन उस तरफ कर रही हैं सो येस दैट इज हैविंग एन एन इनसरमाउंटेबल इफेक्ट ऑन दी ग्लेशियर सो येस दे विल कीप ऑन मेल्टिंग अनटिल वी हैव नो ग्लेशियर्स लेफ्ट ओवर देयर so the key is that the stakeholders need to come up with policies in order to mitigate this you cannot stop it according to what my understanding is but you can definitely try to mitigate the after effects of such events Uh, thank you for that i think with that we will uh, conclude thank you so much again to our esteemed uh, panelists for such an insightful discussion thank you to the audience for joining in and contributing your questions as well uh, thank you everyone <laughs>